Well, I think I'm going to start. We've got 46 on, which is absolutely amazing. So good morning to you all and a warm welcome. My name is Caroline Monaghan and I manage the Radleyan Society. We're broadcasting live from the top of Mansion, looking out over a very beautiful autumnal Radley and with the boys about to go on their Exiac weekend today, it's going to get very quiet around here. We're delighted to welcome you to our second virtual archives event, this time on Radley in the 1950s. And I'm shortly going to hand you over to our archivist, Claire Sargent, who will talk you through some of her selected highlights from the decade. But before we go, we begin, just a few housekeeping items. So as I said, there are 46 of you on this call. So please keep your microphones on mute to a larger degree to avoid any, any interruptions from dogs, Amazon deliveries or curious family members. But all family members are welcome to join the call with you. So that's not a problem at all if you want to do that. If you want to ask a question, then there is a chat function at the bottom of Zoom where you can tap on that and you can type in what you want to ask. Um, but if you want to ask something of Claire directly, she's very happy for that to happen or to share your memories. Um, you could just put your hand up, that would be great. Then we can identify you and we can try and um, say it's now your turn to speak, just to avoid lots of people speaking at once. If we don't spot your hand up at first, I do apologize, just be a bit persistent for us. Um, finally, we also need to let you know that the event is recorded and we'll use it on our website so that we can share this with others who really wanted to attend today but couldn't. And that's some people all around the world in different time zones. Now, without further ado, I'm delighted to be able to introduce you to Claire Sargent, our archivist. Claire has worked at Radley for 25 long years, as well as being our archivist. She's also a classics don, and she's therefore in a prime position to talk about Radley of the 1950s, but also about Radley as it stands today. So Claire, over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm not so sure about whether having been here for that long really qualifies me to talk about the 1950s, but that's what I'm going to do as archivist. And as Caroline said, the big point about today is your, uh, your thoughts and memories and so on. Uh, I've selected a number of, um, of items or topics and I'm going to show you some pictures and a couple of recordings. But the idea of those is to promote or to prompt discussion and to prompt memories. Um, we have got a large group of people, so it will be tricky to, uh, to check if everybody's there. So keep the questions coming and I'll try and keep an idea, a, a, an eye on, on chat and see what's there. But if at the end of this, or even during it, you feel there's something we haven't covered or you have something you want to tell us, then it would be really good to um, just drop me an email, just put those things down, just jot it down as notes and ideas or a letter or any way you want to communicate, just to, just to keep that, uh, to keep that uh, record. So I'm going to start um, by sharing my screen and we'll then have a look and see. Oliver, can I help you? You're raising your hand. Oliver, did you hear me? Are you on mute? Yes, Oliver, please unmute yourself um, because we can't hear you. All right. Okay, we can hear you now. Uh, <clears throat> my photograph has come up with my Christian name, Oliver, but in the 1950s, no one at Radley had a Christian name, and so no one <laughs> will know who I am. Can we rename you then? Well, can, can, can you put Barrett or Oliver Barrett rather than Oliver? Yes, we've got, that's no problem. I think Cassie can, there okay. we go. No, a double T please. A double T please. Cassie, did you get that? Yeah. Okay. Yes, it, it, that, that's a, a strange phenomenon of boys' schools. At girls' schools, we were always um, known by our, by our first names and so on. But I know uh, my husband, who was at school in the, um, the prep school of the 1960s, used to send Christmas cards from Sergeant to Davis or to Etherton or whoever. And they never, ever used their names. <laughs> but hopefully, times have, uh, have moved on a little. Of course, it also gives rise to a lot of um, 
nicknames, most of which I think we probably all want to live down and, and forget and move away from once we leave school. So I'm going to start just with uh, one group of prefects. We've got the warden there in the middle. This is Milligan, just as he's started, 1955, um, after Vaughan Wilkes left. And a number of you I know would have been here um, uh, under, under Vaughan Wilkes and uh, experienced his ordination. Yeah. Somebody? Uh, and uh, Milligan came in there in the, in the mid-1950s. And there were a few other things that happened at that period. Uh, one of the big ones, um, actually, uh, and, and was part of the reason why Vaughan Wilkes left the school, was a massive change in education itself, which, of course, was the introduction of O-levels and A-levels in place of the school certificate. So you would all have mostly have experienced that sudden change. Um, and we could say that that is, that is one of the biggest influences on education that we've had in the last um, uh, in the last century was that shift into uh, everybody doing external exams all of the time. And now we're seeing it, of course, coming through even into uh, infant schools. So that was the major thing. But you'll see the, the group there of uh, of prefects, uh, Milligan in the middle, uh, Peter Cook here, whom we'll talk about a little later on, but we've got Dixon, uh, Anson, oh. Johnston, Harlow. Claire, Claire sorry to interrupt, oh, uh, Mr. Yeah. Dixon at the end would like to just say something. Yeah. Only that I found myself at the end of the picture. <laughs> yes, and, there you are. And Peter is sitting, Peter Cook sitting in front of me. Sitting in front of you, so there I you are, get him. Stephen. Yes, exactly. Michael Bawtry on the other end there. Michael Bawtry very at the big end. in the marionettes. I yes. don't know if Radley still has marionettes, does it? No, they don't, unfortunately. But we will be talking about the marionettes a little later on. Good. Uh, Michael Bawtry as well, yes. Um, who else have we got there? Uh, Richmond and whole. So just a group right there from the from the middle of the era just to introduce them and, and think about who they are. And where I'm going to go from here, excuse me, no that's Michael Bawtry is living in uh, Nova Scotia, Canada now. I've Excellent. been in touch with him. I, I had this set up and unfortunately it's logged out. So you're all now not watching my password. Hello. Hello. You know, Michael Bawtry, is, um, I, he was actually over here just before lockdown in February. Right. <laughs> it's fine, but you ought to read his memoirs, especially volume two. Uh, only got volume one. It's a career. <laughs> right, yes, Michael Bawtry's memoirs. I, I, um, I have my own memoir of, of Michael the first time I met him, which was quite a few years ago. He was here in, in the school. And he stood in Covered Passage and performed one of the uh, an entire song and dance routine from one of the Don's plays for me, just standing there. But what I wanted to share with you now was something which actually arrived in the school only a couple of weeks ago and has been put here. I have a, an internal um, website which the, um, which the boys can access to see things. Um, this was from, uh, let me just check, this is from Richard Langstaff, who came uh, in 1951 uh, and he was in H. And his family, clearing through the attic, found his photograph album from 1951 to 52. Claire, um, are you showing something on the screen because I can't it's see. Not, it's not. At the moment we can just see a selection of photographs. Oh there we go, we can see it now. You can see it now. That's it, yes. It, it, it's constantly asking me to do different things to it. Okay. Richard, so, Richard isn't on the, sh on the uh, Zoom today, is he? No, I'm afraid he's not. Um, one of the reasons why his family was sending his papers is that he's no longer, I think, able to participate. Um, 
so they sent his photographs to us so you can see his uh, his memories here from very early on so this is uh, Eaton Social this lovely photograph of Gordy uh, Chris, and his did you want to say something pocket. Chris you're on mute if you could just take yourself off mute still on mute I'm afraid bottom left of the screen that's it you're off well done um, just to say my surname's Foster hyphen Brown thank you okay lovely uh, so we've got Gordy here this one uh, caused great hilarity in the school that the bursary was here in this old wooden hut, basically, down by the back drive, uh, because they've long since moved into um, uh, next to the War Memorial Arch in some very nice offices they've got there. And I think they've got their eye on other places in school as well. But um, quite fun to see that uh, the bursary, which is such a major part of the school, was here in a little wooden hut. Next to Iva Gilead's cottage. Right. Um, yes, he was down in the cottage itself, wasn't he? Uh, so right the way down uh, on the edge, pretty much on the edge of school in some ways. Picture of Hall with the chestnut tree in blossom. One of the gardeners, uh, the head gardener at the moment, has been looking at that tree. And it's really interesting to have these kind of photographs um, which are all dated because we can actually see the development and growth of trees around the site and uh, one of the things that the boys are doing as a geography project is actually a survey of every tree uh, so we're doing quite a lot with the, um, the history of uh, not just of buildings now but actually the history of the growth of the place uh, the octagon with the uh, with the famous note that it's actually got 10 sides and not eight War Memorial Arch. Um, what are lovely in these photos are the um, uh, the cars that we see every so often. And suddenly we come, what appears to be terribly, terribly modern. So the new science labs, which were opened in uh, 1938, 37, 38. And we've now, of course, just revamped those and built onto them. So the heart of that building is still there, but this this whole glass end to it has, I'm afraid, long since uh, changed. Another photo of Gordy from 1951. Lovely to see the people all sort of just standing around. But what I liked on this one, it's very difficult to see his little note that next to the flagpole is a television aerial, T.E. Cox's television aerial. And now, if this is 1951, this must be one of the first TVs actually in Berkshire at the time, or indeed Oxfordshire in the area. So incredibly advanced that um, Theo Cox has actually got a television and has attached it to the mansion. So one of the things I'm looking at also at the moment is, is the, is the uh, development of new technologies. And I have to say that getting TV that early on is, is fairly, um, fairly advanced for our technology. Although we had radio very early as well. Um, H social. With the social living behind the house. The mansion. Here's again his notes about the TV aerial. And I think it is that little thing that I'm marking up there. So just stuck there on the roof of mansion. Be interesting to see now whether we'd actually get planning permission to put a television aerial up there. I think we probably have to have a satellite buried down a little bit below. But we might go up onto the roof later on and check what's there. And this wonderful photograph of, um, he's on the top of Memorial Arch looking down the drive. And what's most spectacular is the depth of the chestnuts, the uh, four, four rows deep of chestnuts on the Chestnut Avenue. And the chestnuts, unfortunately, have recently been suffering from that terrible chestnut disease, which has taken a few of them out and they're having to come down and be replaced. But the Addington Avenue was, was first planted in the 1890s. So here, 1951, it'd be at the height of its growth. But again, you see all the cars, people standing around, picnics. And 
there's quite an interesting change I hear. We're getting the really sort of what you could call the modern cars of the 1950s, more kind of American styling that you're seeing. I don't know, are these Humbers or Rovers or what? Um, and I did get a message from uh, one of our participants today talking about the number of cars which were hidden in woods and farmland around which belonged to boys. He's particularly talking about his study mate's Vincent motorcycle hidden in Bigwood because the, um, the chairman of the Vincent Motorcycle Society seems to have lived very close to Radley and close to Bigwood. So I'm not sure how many of you want to admit now to having a car buried outside of school. No time, no time for deep admissions. It'd be really nice to hear if people did. Um, because it gives us quite an insight into the idea of, um, of disciplines, of freedom, of uh, how much you could actually get out. And, and really, in the 1950s here, we're still talking about, I would have thought, some elements of petrol rationing. I know when I, get, uh, when I go through some of the files for old Radleyans at the time, and they're talking about whether or not they can make it to Gordy or to All Saints, uh, and whether or not they actually can uh, get hold of petrol to come and do that here in 1951. Mansion through the, what he calls the new arch, which is quite fun because I'm, as I'm sitting here at the top of Mansion, we're sitting at these windows here, which I'm marking, and looking out at this view. And the new arch that we're seeing is, is now between the, cla uh, the classics uh, classrooms, theology and B social above it. Stephen, did you want to say something? Stephen, you're on mute. If you just unmute yourself for me, please. Jumping Brilliant. back, I had a man called Piggott, who I can't remember what his first name was who did have a motorbike right. and was once, a, this is his story, I have to believe it to be true, was once on Abingdon Bridge or, or with his bike when a master was seen approaching. He says that he grabbed the nearest girl and <laughs> pretended that she was his girlfriend until the man had walked past. He averted his gaze <laughs> and he still had his motorbike. Uh, and the other thing was, I was only going to say it on passant, um, you talk about the mansion and that was indeed so, but it was really always known as the house. Mm. No one taught, really called it the mansion. We said we were going to the house, because I guess it was the only one. Well, we had many houses, but of course, I don't know why, but that's what it was. Uh, that, um, that was something that came up. I recently um, uh, wrote a book with the village, uh, Radley Village History Club uh, called Manor and Village, A Thousand Year Story, which is actually about the whole of the estate here, right the way through from Abingdon Abbey in the 12th century and, be, uh, and before then, uh, right the way through till the time the school started. And um, one of the issues we had was what to call that building. Uh, because of course in school, it's called the mansion. Technically uh, and historically, since it was built in 1722, it's actually Radley Hall, but nobody's ever called it Radley Hall. And then when I uh, when I looked into the paperwork, uh, the Stonehouse family in the in the 18th century, having built the house in the 1720s, they variously call it the house at Radley, Radley Hall, my mansion, and so on. So its name has shifted across time. But uh, I know that in A.K. Boyd's uh, history, uh, in the index there, he actually talks about the house. And he has a point that he, that he makes how appalling it is that it's increasingly being called the mansion, whereas it really should be called the house. And Boyd, of course, was here in 1905 as, uh, as a senior prefect and then here as a don uh, and as a historian. So he was very uptight about the fact that it shouldn't be called the mansion. But uh, as I say, I've actually got a note from the 18th century calling it that as well. Claire, so it's quite tricky. Yeah. Um, so um, Malcolm Neal would like to say something. He's had yeah. his hand up. 
for a little while. And then John, John, just before Malcolm speaks, John has said on the chat, he didn't know of anyone who kept a car in Bigwood or anywhere right. else. And I knew most of the reprobates. So this is a motorbike. <laughs> My only point about the mansion was that we were discouraged from calling it the mansion because it was thought to be too grand. <laughs> I, I'm not aware of the um, his, historical reasons, but that, that, that was the reason given to us as boys at the time. Yes, there's a, there's a, there's a sort of um, a, a slight <coughs> sense of snobbery about it, isn't it? That you, you don't call it by a, a, a fancy name. And in some ways it isn't. <coughs> yes. Jonathan. Hello. Yep. Um, I would. I was 51 to 56, and as far as I was concerned, and the people I knew, it was the mansion, although we were aware that some people would sort of pedantically wave a finger and say the house. <laughs> but in colloquial terms, it was the mansion, and possibly I differ from Stephen, merely in perhaps that the patois of each social might have been a little different. Mr. Anson, did you want to speak? I was at Radley from 53 to 58, and it was always called the mansion, right. as far as I remember. So it was shifting, shifting <laughs> at that point, wasn't it? Yes. Mr. Anson, did you have your hand up? You're talking to me? No, it was uh, Ross Anson who had his oh, hand up. You're talking to me, yeah. Yes, I did. Uh, you were talking about uh, cars and things. Mm. <coughs> uh, I had a car there. <laughs> A, right. a very old blue standard eight open open car and i kept it i think it was somewhere near the bursar's office actually but i did use it a couple of times without anyone knowing <laughs> <laughs> right so they were around you you had to uh, you had to know the hiding places jonathan <laughs> did you want to add to that <laughs> well i wanted to add about the uh, mansion or house unless you're going to come to this because it was on the top floor of that. Apart from Theo Corks, there was also the Reverend C.E.B. Charles Neat mm -hmm. and the, the wonderful Poetry Society. <clears throat> so she sat on the top floor there, looking out uh, the back way over College Pond um, with the sessions of the Poetry Society. And that's something I shall never forget. Right. I think I, I think Ellis also had a room in the mansion. Mm. Yes, there, I, I think mo most of the rooms. There were some on the ground floor, I think, but most of the rooms at the on the upper floors were were Don's flats. The Poetry Society. I, I uh, I'm glad you picked up. I do have the minute books of the Poetry Society, so I I haven't got them out today, but they are in existence and, and still there. And uh, working at the moment on the history of uh, the influence of chapel, which is something I've been looking into, had a, a number of um, wonderful letters from uh, old Radians who went on to become clergymen who were influenced into that um, and, and, and uh, by Charles Neat's example. So he had a real impact on, uh, on, on old Radians' later lives and on their callings which has been wonderful to read the letters that have come through about that. So we've well, got the general to... consensus on the chat seems to be that it was mansion. Um, right. And then a a Tim Moxton has said he's always enjoyed the Poetry Society. He was its secretary for a year or two. However, interestingly, Mr. Robert says much more interesting was the Danish maids in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know anything about that, Claire? I do. <laughs> do we want to record this? <laughs> and Mr. Evans has his hands up, so maybe he could uh, add to this. Yes, and I can remember. <clears throat> I, I can remember going to Henley on the train, and there was mm. a, a four or five of us in the carriage, complete with the two Danish maids. Yes, they're, they're, they're very mysterious how they happen to be in Radley. It's, it's almost like a kind of exchange trip, isn't it? But I'm not sure if any Radleyans go, but uh, quite what the Danish maids are doing, I don't know. They do appear in some photographs and certainly in, in a number of memoirs. Apparently one was called Hopalong Chastity. <laughs> Mr. 
Right. <laughs> Shall we move right. on? So we'll move on. We'll move on. We'll move on. There we, there we are. I remember hop along chastity. <laughs> Right. She was lame. I, I dread to think was she lame before she came. But, <laughs> I say, let's not go there. So uh, I thought we'd move on to uh, the uh, the Radleyan of the period who call uh, raises most of the um, uh, people's reminiscences. So we put this together. Uh, one of the really interesting things is the number of times that uh, somebody like Peter Cook or um, indeed Andrew Motion, uh, when he became Poet Laureate, um, there, there's a kind of a myth that people who go into drama, go into poetry, um, must have been really dead, dreadfully unhappy at school and everything that they're doing is, is, a, is a push against what school was like and what, what it did to them, uh, particularly if they're at a boys boarding school. And it seems to me this is very much a myth because this this doesn't come through to me as um, as, as compatible with the achievements of Peter Cook when he was here at Radley. So he became head of C. He's winning prizes like the Declamations Prize, the Medrashkin Trophy, the German Prize, the Speech Prize, obviously. And you can see he's he's editing the Red Leon, he's got the he's got Shakespeare, the literary, the debating, the marionettes, the dramatic societies, the film society. It's actually in CCF, but then everybody was, and he ended up with two A-levels. So one of the things that we need to do is, 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 is to recall this particular character and the influence that he had both on school and on uh, life outside of it. And this is uh, a couple of things from the Dramatic Society. Claire, before we move on, uh, just a yeah. quick question from John. The dorm at the top of Croom Tower was occupied by F-Social, although yeah. all the rest of it was A-Social. Yes. Do you know why, or does anyone else know why? Yes. In about 52, we, we used it as a dormitory for people like Timothy Hall, myself, Robin Davis, and the cricketer, cricketing lock up there. Uh, and it was just a single dormitory, I think. R and Robert Hutton, by the way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So re really just a little bit of an overflow, because I think at the time, uh, F Social was still an in-house uh, in social. Y yes. An in-college social. Yes, yes. It, it was. Um, in the big dormitory, the long dormitory shared with Cox's um, halfway, halfway along. Yes, because one of the things that we always need to remember from the 1950s still was that there weren't necessarily all of the boarding houses in fixed locations as they are now. There were the in-college socials yes. and the out socials. Yes, uh, which is always a tricky thing to try and get through to boys now because from their point of view, every social has been permanently fixed in the building it's in and one of the one of the issues I have constantly with the tutors is that obviously because they're all hyper competitive they all want to know who's got the oldest social and that's a really hard thing to answer because technically F social now are in that long dormitory which is the original dormitory uh, which goes back to the 18, uh, early 1850s, 1849, I think. Um, then we've got all of the socials A to G were founded or named simultaneously A to G uh, in the 1870s, with H coming in for a couple of years and vanishing and then coming back again. Then you've got D social, um, which was Taunton Rakes was the first person to actually build a boarding house. And it so happens that he was the D social tutor at the time and is, and it is now, uh, it came to still be uh, D social's home. So that's the oldest boarding house built in the 1880s. So Thanks when the- That's yeah. brilliant. 
Um, we have a we have a, another gentleman who wants to tell a brief anecdote about Peter Cook mm, and a jug of soup. Now, is this a good time or would you? Now's a, now's a good time. Yes. Okay, Mr. Mr. Oxton, you're up. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Uh, okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good. Okay. Um, the story about Peter Cook is um, well rather absurd really. Um, you may remember that in Hall in the 1950s we used to eat at long tables with I think 17 boys on each table. There'd be a senior prefect at the top and then boys going down each side, um, the senior ones closest to the prefect and the junior mm -hmm. ones at the bottom. The two junior boys were the, I think we were called the kitchen fags or something like that, and we had to go and fetch the food at the start of the meal and bring it to the table. It was, it fell to me to bring the jug of soup. Now the jugs that were used for the soup in those days were um, tall cylindrical white jugs made of three parts, a handle, um, the barrel of the, of the jug and the bottom. So I brought this along with its steaming soup in, plonked it down onto the table on Peter Cook's right hand and he lifted it up. Unfortunately, the bottom of the jug stayed on the table with the result that uh, soup went everywhere, <laughs> um, mainly onto Peter's lap and also the, um, the house prefect, I guess it must have been, who was on his immediate right. So of course he <laughs> delivered a, a, uh, a hail of expletives at me, wretched boy, what have you done? Go and get some cloths and mop up all this mess. So I went off with the other uh, table fag and we got these and mopped it all up. Nobody had any soup. We went on to the main course and nobody ever trusted me to carry a jug of soup ever again. And that was all. Thank you. So much. Lovely story. <laughs> Wonderful story. Okay. So yes, so we've got Peter Cook here in the Dramatic Society, uh, in The Alchemist and in Love Saves Lost, and The Marionettes. And I know a lot of you were involved with The, uh, with the Marionettes. And we so do have- Is the screen change, has, should the screen have changed? We're still on Croom's Arch at the moment. Screen should have changed a while back. There we are, thank you. Okay, so I get back one? Yes. So here we've got that? Yes. Yes. I think I may still have the record from somewhere. Black and White Blues. Yes, I, I do have a copy of Black and White Blues. One thing I can't do with it uh, because of the Peter Cook estate is that I can't make a recording available. Um, which is a great pity. It would be lovely to be able to hear it uh, for us. Mr. Metcalf has his hand up, Claire. I don't know if yep. you just wanted to say something before we, we play that. Yep. And Mr. Evans as well. Mr. Metcalf first. Uh, so you are you on mute, Mr. Metcalf? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, I have said a slightly bad story about uh, Hall. Um, we had a, a more senior boy than me, whose name will not be mentioned, but he was nicknamed Harpick because he was, in quotes, a bit round the bend, close quotes. <laughs> I, I was relatively junior and he was serving out um, uh, pud. And I said, come on, Harpick, hurry on. And... Um, about uh, 10 or 15 minutes later, he rose from his seat and we were on the, on the left of, of, of Hall as you look towards the, the, the main door. Um, he left his seat and walked towards me and stabbed me in the neck with, with a knife. And um, I, I was pretty shocked. But um, Bill Llewellyn Jones, who was our social tutor, said, tough it's your fault you shouldn't have insulted him and so i still have the scar on the back of my neck <laughs> and i wish him well if he's still alive 
uh, and anyway, I, whether or not that's a good story to tell or, or not, I don't know. But uh, if, if anybody in eSocial was there at that time, they may or may not have remembered that event. Okay, I'm I'm now unraising my hand. Thank you, Mr. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm appalled, George, that uh, the knives were sharp enough. <laughs> Just worry. <laughs> Mr. Evans, did, uh, did you want to say something next? And then Mr. Neil. Yes, just to say, I, my copy of the record is, is in undamaged state. I should be able to do a digital copy of it if you want it. Thank you. Um, it's not so much a question of being able to make a copy as being uh, having the copyright permission to do it. Um, so I, 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 I can make a digital copy but I can't share it and I can't put it on the website. Understood. Um, so that's the thing. Although we will in a moment come to something where some people might start claiming their, their copyright is being infringed. Thank you. Mr. Evans and then David and then Mr. Harlow in that order, please. I said my piece just now about the copying. Okay, sorry. Um, Thank you. It's Mr. Neil, apologies, Mr. Neil. That, that's all right. Um, hearing George Metcalf um, reminds me, he'll um, I've no doubt let us know if the story isn't correct, but I do remember he had a terrible stutter and um, he too was delivering not soup but porridge um, to the end of the table and um, the house prefect nearest to him said to him, uh, why aren't you using the, the proper cloth to hold that hot soup with? And instead of which he'd, he'd pulled his sleeves of his coat down um, uh, and was holding it with um, the sleeves of his coat. And um, George had this terrible stutter, as I say, and he started to stutter to the extent that um, he was, as he stuttered, he was getting... Uh, closer and closer to the porridge until finally he dipped him his head into this hot porridge and as we've just noticed he doesn't stutter now and has, has hasn't to the best of my knowledge stuttered since Can I'm you sure you me? if that story is not correct <laughs> thank, you. thank you for that um david you were next you're on mute if i could just ask you to unmute um no my name is david harvey did you get that thank you yes um i was just a quickly on the issue of the marionettes and the black and white blues i've still got a recollection of uh, of the lines which of course in this politically correct day you probably can't say now but it was all involved something about there's nothing wrong with marrying a darky. Who cares if the kids are khaki? I know that was a sort of punchline in this particular uh, one of his songs, which uh, Peter Cook had written. Thank you. Thank you for that. Jonathan, uh, you wanted to speak. And then I think, um, Tony, you had your hand up. And then after that, I think we, we'll probably need to move on. But thank you. Just um, I, I agree about the lines from the Black and White Blues. And I see that the program you have in front of us has the native bearers and I can remember um, a reference to our bearers and bearer bearers may the Lord spare us but more to the point um, while we're in high while we're in hall for high table we must remember um, Mr. Boylet who served at high table and who um, swept some crumbs into uh, somebody's lap while he was tidying up there and then uh, we're, when sort of remonstrated we said well oh, your crumbs and he was the man who Peter Cook turned into E.L. Whiskey, Mr. Boylet from High Table. So a, a glass raised to, to his memory please. Thank you. Yes. Tony would you like to unmute yourself? Tony, are you able to unmute yourself? I've got you as Tony's iPad. Uh, 
That's it. Hello. Thank you. Got you. Yes, thank you. In relation to Mr. Boylet, um, uh, he, Peter Cook used to say that Boylet would say to him, yeah, I, I, I would have liked to have done the judging, but I never had the Latin. That, that was what he basically said. That's correct, Brilliant. isn't it? Uh, Brilliant. Thank yeah. you. A few things on the chat now. Right. Um, Mr. Mr. Oxen's got black and white, black and white, oh no, hang on, black and white, black and white, just like the whiskey, but if they have a tiny tot, it may be rather risky. Thank you for that lyric. <laughs> Mr. Collins has got a copy of Monday at... Man Man thank you. Uh, sorry, it moved in the chat, so I, couldn't, I lost, <laughs> lost, the, lost the thread. A later marionette production, if the archives are in need. I'm just reading out some of the chat stuff here. Uh, somebody's reminiscing, Mr. Collins is reminiscing about Sailing Club and Chris Ellis and Chris Ellis and Sailing on the Theodora, also building mm -hmm. cadet boats in the carpentry shop. So just in the interest of time, some lovely stuff so far, thank you. Um, we're just going to move on now because I know Claire wanted to play Black and White Blues for us. No, no, not Black and White Blues. Oh, apologies. Uh, let's hope that this is, is this sharing? Can you see the screen? I can see Radley Digital Archive. Yes, okay. And somebody mentioned Monday at Mandolino's. And here we go. Yes. I'll just go back. Uh, we the copy of uh, Mondays at Mandolinos that we have, ha there's been some dispute over the last couple of weeks since I put this up on the website uh, as to whose actual disc it is and how we came to have it. Uh, so it might well be that I need to return this copy to the original Radleyan because we have the feeling that it's been lent to somebody and lent to somebody and ended up here, not necessarily been given. So it might well be that if somebody wanted to give us legitimately a copy of Mondays at Mandolinos, that would be really good. Uh, and I also do need to apologize to uh, Peter Raby uh, for his lyrics and the musicians there, um, that really I should have their copyright permission before that goes out. So if, uh, if anybody, if they're here or if anybody knows them, that would be helpful too. So we were talking about Hall. So in uh, the middle of the 1950s, we had this wonderful set of photographs that were taken from the Daily Mail. Uh, this one, I've, I've got a, a very large copy of it, which is actually in the school library at the moment. And the boys absolutely love it. And I tell you, the thing that they really fall on 
They walk in and they say, they had flowers. They've got flowers on the table. We want flowers on the table. Uh, given that they all, they, they're also working on um, uh, a, a self-service cafeteria, I'm not sure how they would have appreciated the uh, things like the jug of soup that George was talking about, or these great tins of food. And I do know that uh, somebody from the later 1960s, they talk about when the cafeteria came in for the first time in 1972, that as a junior boy, it was the first time he got a square meal. So I'm sure that a lot of you have memories of that, that you're really talking about how is this equitably distributed, all this food coming down the table. So we've got one there uh, of that. And then we've got this lovely photograph of a chemistry lesson. And I love the fact that although nobody's wearing gowns, they're all in, um, uh, they're all in very smart suits with very smart haircuts. I do not have the name for this teacher. That's a teacher or a demonstrator. I'm thinking it's a teacher because he's looking at the blackboard. So if anybody could send me that, Please. that would be lovely. Clay pipes, Clayton. 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 Excellent. Clay pipes, Clayton. <laughs> Why was he called clay pipes? I've no idea. Did, no he, idea. Did, did, did he smoke traditional clay pipes? I don't think so, but he had a slightly broad accent. You know, don't rely on friction was one of his metaphors. <laughs> When you put a, a flask down, don't run yeah. out of friction. So very yes, interesting then to have um, somebody who was clearly uh, of a slightly different mould to a standard Radley teacher. Well, yes. he he was a don, but not a social tutor. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, and I think that bloke, the um, the fellow in the front, looking downwards, is probably Robert Hutton. That one. Yeah. Yeah. That's me. That, 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 that's you. Has he been really finished or is that somebody saying? No, no just, just out of interest. Uh, just out of interest. Excellent. Lovely. Yes, this, this, is, this is great fun as, as a uh, thing. Picture of um, life in a social. And I have had. Uh, uh, an identification for this recently. Somebody who said it's definitely me uh, and his wife has confirmed it's definitely him. So <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure how, uh, but um, what I like is, is this very, very tiny room that you've got. Ties, the array of ties that this boy has. Because he's quite a junior boy at this point. He's yes. about 13. So how he has managed to acquire all of this set of ties already is a bit of a, a mystery. But I do love his carefully positioned um, props of uh, cricket bat and tennis racket uh, with, the, uh, with the lovely Slazenger tennis racket frame, which they don't use these days, but a great thing. Mm. And even his pads are just lying around. So it's a great uh, shot. Um, it's a couple of interventions, Claire. Yep. Oh, yep. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, so uh, Mr. Hammersley had his hand up, so I'll come to you in a minute, Mr. Hammersley. Uh, just a couple of things. John says this is a long dormitory cubicle. Um, mm -hmm. Mr. Roberts, picture of halls, mainly be social. And then Alex, oh no, there was a story about, oh yes, from Mr. Metcalf. He says he did have a rather violent stammer, but often had his head put in porridge, um, but he was cured by Lionel Logue. He took part in the TV programme, The Real King's Speech, following that eponymous film. Since Radley, lots of TV, including writing and presenting my own children's series. So there is a happy so, ending to a porridge story there. So I'll move on to you, Mr. Metcalf, if you want to unmute yourself. Or was it Mr. Hammersley? I think it was Mr. Hammersley. Mr. Hammersley, I do apologise. Mr. Hammersley, would you like to unmute yourself? Sorry, I'm going through a number of screens here, so people are merging, so bear with me. Mr. Hammersley, um, could you unmute yourself, please? That, 
If you could just unmute yourself, Mr. Hammersley. I think bottom left. We can come back to you, Mr. Hammersley, or if yes, you put yeah. something in the chat. Yes, um, yes I, I, I can see uh, that it's clearly a long dormitory um, cubicle because of the window, these, these lovely lancet windows which are in there. But I thought what I'd like to do is uh, share this image. Say long, long. Oh, Mr. Hammersley has managed to unmute himself. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Can, thank you. Good. Go, going back to the photograph of Dr. Clayton's uh, chemistry lesson. Mm -hmm. The person in the picture who is at the front of the picture is Colin Harrison. Right. Uh, Colin Harrison died earlier this year. Thank you. Excellent. So will he have an obituary in this year's Real Grand Lee? I'm just checking with uh, Simon Brand whether uh, we need to use that photograph then for his obituary, but we'll just check that later on. Okay. Uh, I thought what we'd uh, what we'd look at here is this lovely photograph from the um, 1890s of a boys' social at that period, just to compare it of, of, of a boys' study, just to compare it with the um, one we looked at. Now I've enlarged it, but that's clearly not happening on other screens. But you can see this lovely um, boy sitting there casually, so many flowers again around, fresh hyacinths, teacups, pictures, and the amount of space that he has compared with that little cubicle in, uh, in Long Dormitory. Just that's just an aside. That didn't share the link, did it? Okay. Right. Now, sport is something I haven't touched on uh, very much in these reminiscences. Um, this is again is from that Daily Mail photo shoot. But uh, if any of you were wet bobs, you will of course remember uh, Joe Eason. And uh, this boater sitting on the side here his, is his actual Henley boater that he, uh, that Sherry Eason sent us last year. So a lovely memento coming through from there. And again, the senior prefect of the second prefect. Flowers again as a, as a theme. And uh, tennis rackets with, uh, with a press again as a theme. But I love the tattiness of the, uh, of the chair. Now I know um, at some periods there was a, there was a great uh, market in secondhand furniture. And when you took over a new, uh, if you took over a new study or you moved up a study, went up in the ranks or whatever, uh, you, you sold your old furniture, you buy new furniture. I've got a wonderful um, uh, auction catalogue pretty much from 1917, um, two boys who were selling off all their study furniture before they went off to uh, fight in, in World War One. But I've not got such an example from the 1950s, but I can see people nodding there that you rec recall this, this happening. Yes? Does anybody want to come back with a, a, a memory of that? Just nods. So we move on from those to the Greek plays, which were clearly a massive, um, a massive thing during the 1950s. They started in the 1940s with Rinch. They had actually gone back to um, the early 1900s. We'd had a, a series of, of Greek plays as well, based on the Cambridge Greek plays and using the same music. 
Uh, and then, of course, we had Rinch. So we started here. Um, uh, there was an Electra in 1945. There's Trichinii in 1951. Medea from 1957. I did receive an anecdote about uh, Medea, somebody talking on the um, off the roof of mansion, I think. It's a fairly, uh, fairly graphic play, Medea, to be uh, um, tossing, uh, tossing people off the mansion roof, but uh, that seems to be the, the, the general thrust of it. Uh, so Sorry to interrupt, place. just, just yeah. uh, one little observation from the last, um, uh, from Mr. Alcock, I think he had his, uh, sorry, Mr. Harlow had his hand up. Um, nope. The boy in the cu cubicle would have had a study as well, unless he was still in social hall. Um, he would have shared a study uh, with, he would have shared a study, that's Noel Slowcock, lovely man and yep. super crop forward. There you yep. are, Mr. Harlow. And then Mr. Uh, Rock had his hand yes. up and Mr. I, I, I was in the Madeira and I was the mm -hmm. messenger. And right. It, that, can, that part consisted of one enormously long speech. <laughs> uh, and I can still remember the end of the first line, but not much else. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't think it's the Madeira which actually has the don't shoot the messenger line, is it? I think that's Antigone. But, no, um, no, no, no. <laughs> and then Mr. Oh, sorry, Mr. Roddicks has his hand up virtually as well. We can't see you, but we can see your hand, Mr. Roddicks, if you want to unmute yourself. William, can't quite hear you, Mr. Roddicks, yet, but I can see you've unmuted. Um, I fear we may have tech problems there. If you, if we, if you can put something on the chat, that, that might be better. Um, back to you, Claire. Right. So, uh, so the Medea. So the Greek plays were really um, interesting and uh, innovative, and quite a challenge to um, to perform them. But uh, it's this one I wanted to talk about, which is Edward II, because uh, I don't know if any of you took part in this as the school play. But at the time and still. Radley remains the only all boys school to have performed Edward II for public consumption. So actually before a public audience. Uh, I've got the reviews from the Times uh, and I spoke um, at, uh, at one of our old Radleyan days a couple of, um, a few months ago now, <laughs> Well, part, part of the problem of COVID is that we all lose track of time. But I was talking to Michael Meredith, who came as an English Don in 1958 uh, and uh, went on from here to teach at Eton, became, uh, he, he um, set up the modern manuscript collections at Eton College. But Michael actually stood there and said Edward II was the reason why he came to Radley because he felt that a school which was brave enough to put on a play about homosexuality uh, and invite a public audience to it was a school where he, as a gay teacher, felt that he could actually come and be comfortable. So Edward II was actually a groundbreaking thing and it remains, as I say, the only school, Radley remains the only school who are known to have performed it. So I don't know if anybody uh, else remembers being in Edward II or have any idea that that was the impact of it. Um, um, Claire, there were a couple of things on the chat. Uh, apparently mm -hmm. it's Freddie Hole on the left. And then Mr. Oxen says he was in two Greek plays in the chorus as a cloud and as a frog. Right, Later, yes. I went on to star in another Greek play as Socrates at the Arts Theatre Cambridge. Mm. Mike Brearley, later a successful cricketer, was Hermes in that production. So thank you for that, <laughs> Mr. Oxen. Lovely, yes. Else? I think Mr. Rocks, you had your hand up earlier. I wondered if you still wanted to say something. Now that you've mentioned Michael Meredith, I know him quite well. Mm -hmm. He's actually a colleague of my son-in-law. I now live in, in Windsor right. and, and, and they were both on the staff at Eton. Yes. And I, uh, he, uh, Michael Meredith thought my brother at Radley, who was quite a lot younger than me, Radley was his first teaching job, and, uh, but I never knew about it, but the second, I must ask him. Thank you. Mm. 
Can no, I ask you something uh, about Medea? Yes. I was Medea in Medea. And of course, Medea kills her two children. Mm. I seem to remember they were the Bursa's children. <laughs> and, <laughs> when I, having done the deed, I appeared for the very last scene from the top of the mansion house, not to throw the children over, as someone was suggesting. Uh, they were already dead. Uh, but my, uh, to save me from falling from the, the top of the mansion house, Paddock had hold, I think his name was Graham, Paddock had hold of my ankles to make sure I didn't tip over the edge. Brilliant story. Um, <laughs> Mr. Harlow uh, asked us to remember that Peter Way um, was instrumental in these productions and obviously a superb English teacher as well. Yes. Yes, I was uh, just about, that, that segues very nicely into uh, Peter Way. Uh, because of course we come to the Don's plays. This is, uh, this is one of uh, Peter Way's later um, uh, plays, The Case of the 7% Solution. And of course he did write a great many of them and starred in a lot of them, having been Earl Redlian. And the huge amount of cross-dressing that they always seem to involve in. I, I know I've taken part in Don's play and it was very irritating because all the, all the best female parts were taken by all my colleagues. And uh, those of us who were women who were in it were allowed to be either small schoolgirls or the pretty walk-on love interest who got taken off very quickly. Uh, but anything which actually had any meat or development of character went always to the men because they were funnier in drag than we were. So the Dawn's plays, a massive uh, memory for everybody. And um, I think a very strong influence, we go back to Peter Cook and we go back to the marionettes, a uh, very strong influence on the kind of thing that he was doing. So has anybody got any memories of them that would like to come back at me about the Dawn's um, plays? Tony's iPad has, has a hand up, um, um, or did have. Um, Tony, did you want to say something if you're still there? I can't see you. Tony's iPad, if you take yourself off mute. No, I can't see you. Um, sorry, do apologise. Would anybody else like to say anything? Rod Roddick's yes. raised a hand, um, just came up. Am I, am I invited to speak? It's Tony Pierce-Smith here. Yes. Yes, absolutely. okay, well, um, <laughs> the Dom's plays were absolutely uh, asto astonishing. They are my best and most brilliant memories in relation to Bradley. And I think the, the very best one was um, the one that when they had um, Goldsmith and Taylor as the, as the two Rekka uh, Kek Kek Koak Koak, Rekka Kek Kek Koak. I don't know if, you, if anyone remembers that, but I think it was 19, probably 1953. Um, and the, Iva Gilead, I remember singing, um, I went to the festival of Britain. I don't know if people remember the festival of Britain. I found it had disappeared as well, for the dome <laughs> of discoveries now, a great house in Belvedere, and the pylons now, pylon, down in now a pylon down in hell. <laughs> And there were some beautiful tunes there, I think, um, composed by Sam Lester and I think probably Theo Cox. Um, those strange moonlight blues. Do you remember that, Jonathan? No. Uh, the strange, uh, absolutely no. beautiful tune. Da 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 they haunt and they taunt me, those strange moonlight blues. Yeah, anyway, yeah, really beautiful stuff. Etched wow, that was amazing. Thank you. You've still got a great voice, Mr. Pierce Smith. <laughs> Fabulous. And oh, oh, I, Charles oh I don't know. <laughs> Charles Rinch, please, on the Don's plays. Yes. Have you got... Have you got Charles Rinch in Don's Place anywhere? 
oh, you must go to Moscow. And somebody, Trotsky, used to say, oh. on my knee, did we care at Trotsky? We did not ski, no, not <laughs> me, etc. He was wonderful. Yes, brilliant, brilliant. Well, we, we have, um, we have um, Peter Way's complete collection of uh, material for the Don's plays. Um, we have uh, Seddy Borney and Theo Cox's music um, in manuscript. We don't have all of the um, scripts, but we do have all of the programmes and quite a few of the scripts. Uh, we do not have, of course, any recording because they, they were never recorded. Uh, and what always strikes me uh, 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 as astonishing is, as, as you say, that they have such an impact on the memory, but they kind of have been performed only a couple of times each. There were, there were seldom reprises. Um, so it's a new one every year or every couple of years, but not a repeat. And yet everybody can sing them and remembers the words. They must have been reverberating around the school for days on end afterwards. But going back to the Greek plays and the marionettes and the Don's uh, plays, what I noticed when I was um, drawing up a list of all the drama productions is, is how often they're all interconnected. So um, the, uh, the Greek play one year was Philoctetes, Sophocles Philoctetes, uh, and the marionettes that same year did the admirable Philly. Um, and there was also a Kiss Me Herky in the year they did Hercules. So the marionettes were taking off the Greek plays, which I think is absolutely lovely. And the number of times, say, the Don's plays were picking up the same, the same themes. So they're all really beautifully interconnected. So from my point of view, this is, is pretty much where I was uh, going to end. I'm going to end as school always ended. And hopefully this will come through. Now you have a choice. I'm going to stop uh, with the um, with Sunday Even song for 1956, which was a recording broadcast on the BBC. So this will be one of the first outside broadcasts. Um, and again, thinking about that new technology we were talking about earlier with the, with the television aerial. So we'll start with this, but we can come back to Monday at Mandolino's if people would like us to, like me to play us out on that. The end of
So that, that is where I intended to end. But please come back at us with, with more reminiscences. Um, and Caroline, are there other questions on the chat? Um, somebody, uh, has anybody got a clean version of the Brahms Requiem disc I could borrow as one? Um, so do respond to the chat on that. Um, just a few little stories. Um, and there was Poppy, Goldsmith of course was Poppy from Popper Catet, Popper, I cannot say it, Popper Popper Kettle, Kettle, Kettle Pop the Kettle on the Stove. <laughs> Who put that on? That was me. Um, and then um, we have uh, another artistic triumph in my day was a film of the 39th Psalm. Is this on the website? That's from Oliver Barrett. Uh, the, the 39th Psalm, I would love to have a copy of it, but we do not seem to have a copy of it. And um, it's a really important piece of Radley archive, that one, uh, because of course it went to the uh, went to a film festival and was awarded a prize on its own in its own right as a piece of innovative filming. Um, because the uh, British Film Institute were running a, um, a school's film competition and they were expecting all sorts of film but they were certainly not expecting a study on the 39th Psalm uh, beautifully filmed and beautifully sung and they didn't know what to do about it. It was so different and so uh, in a different league to everything else from other schools. So it was given a prize in its own right but not awarded the prize as a school film. Um, so I would love as if we could have a copy of that, but I haven't got one. Well, um, Mr. Hamilton, you've got your hand up. Um, please go ahead, take yourself off mute. Yes, I just think, as I have actually put down the note, that it's, we should mention uh, Mr. Brookman. I can't, don't remember his first name. Who was the who was the brilliant promoter of that film? And in fact, I think he directed mm -hmm. it, and generally of films at Radley, as well as athletics and the building of athletic track. And, and he was a tremendous physics teacher, and really he's well worth remembering as one mm -hmm. of the most outstanding yes. dons at Radley and during my time. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to say, I'm um, sort of wrap things up now because I'm conscious of time. So thank you to Claire. That was incredibly interesting. And thank you to all of you. I really enjoyed hearing all of your stories. Um, we will wrap up, but Claire will stick around at the end, as will we all, if you just want to ask a few more questions and share a few more stories. So do stay on the, ch uh, on the call if you want to. Um, before you go, I would like to briefly tell you about the book that Claire is developing for our 175th anniversary celebration, which will take place in 2022. The book is called Untold Stories, and it will explore the history of Radley through Sewell and Singleton's uh, original founding principles and through your stories. Um, so we'll advertise this in December's upcoming Old Radley, and there'll be a leaflet insert, which will look like this. Um, so please do look out for it. Um, that'll tell you more about it and how to order it. So thank you everyone for attending. Those who wish to leave now may, may do so and those who wish to stay on then please do so too and we'll keep going. Thank you very much. Right, I should just let people leave. We've still got a few people staying, which is lovely. Uh, Mr. Dixon, would you like to unmute yourself? I would, I'm really interested to know if anyone has any recollections, although it's very unlikely, and I'm afraid it's back to Peter Cook. In my early part of my time at Radley, boys still beat other boys for serious misdemeanors. You had to get permission from your social tutor uh, and sign the book and all the rest of it, so it was, but nevertheless, boys were beating boys uh, as part of the the activities for misdemeanors in school. But uh, the, the beating was inflicted by the uh, house prefect. Uh, but all the other prefects had to stand and watch in order to see that uh, fair play happened and there was nothing untoward about it. And Peter had to beat a boy in his house in his social, and we were all gathered round 
in the Don stud in the pup study. And Peter took the cane and flexed it, and the poor child bent over the, the desk. And Peter said nothing for a while, and then he said to us, I can't do this. And he we all agreed with him. And I have a belief that this was when beating ended at Radley. And I would love to know if there's any record as to whether it did really end, but it suddenly stopped us in our tracks. And it took a lot of bravery from Peter because it just went past on. You know, I got beaten when I was a little boy. Now it's my turn was the sort of attitude to it. Peter broke that. But I would love to know uh, if, if there's anything official in the records as, as to how it stopped, because it certainly went on when I first arrived there in 1951. Mr. Hamilton, did you want to add, add to that or come back on that? If you unmute yourself, please. There we are. Yes, no, I, I fear it wasn't, didn't finish with Peter Cook because um, I certainly got beaten after that time. For as far as I can remember, it was for failing to come up and show my well-polished shoes to the, to the bully at the top of the table which was counted as uh, insubordination. And uh, after much of uh, poor old Loopy Taylor, the, the temporary head of, uh, temporary, uh, head of the, my house and Milligan both spent two hours to explain why I, it, it had to go ahead in order to preserve the spirit of the school. So I was beaten, but that was certainly after, after Peter Cook had gone. Um, I like to think that it did, it did disappear soon afterwards because it was completely ridiculous. Uh, so there we are. That's all my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. De Corsi, Ireland. I was beaten in my second term uh, and the head of social happened to be captain of rackets. So uh, I had only three welts from six strokes. He was that accurate. <laughs> I swore I'd never get beaten again. Mr. Bennett. Um, I, I failed my new boys test when I arrived at Radley and I was summoned to see Peter Cook, who was the head of the house. And um, I was extremely nervous, as you can imagine. And I had with me, I cannot think why, a Penguin edition of Jacobean plays. And Peter saw it and immediately said, let's talk about that. And I had no beating and nothing. And I was extremely relieved, I can tell you. He was an extraordinarily nice man. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. That's a lovely story. I Mr. Think... Ken Smith, did you want to say something? If you unmute yourself, please. Mr. Pierce Smith, you need to unmute yourself, please. Thank you. I'm unmuted. <laughs> um, talking about dirty, dirty shoes, uh, I remember um, in my second term, I think it was at Radley, uh, I was, um, uh, I was, uh, uh, interviewed by the prefect, the duty prefect, school prefect in charge when entering hall because I had dirty shoes. And I remember I, I re went back to social hall and wrote a little poem, which was, his name is Freddie Bircher. His rank is second pup. He doesn't mean to hurt you, but just to blow you up. Hey, you there with filthy shoes. I see a muddy speck. The next time you know polish shoes, you'll get a double check. And um, I submitted it to the, to the Radleyan and they actually published it, believe it or not. <laughs> well, it's very good. Anybody else uh, want to say anything? They had your hands up earlier. Uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Anson and then Mr. De Corsi Island. Uh, yes, I, I uh, remember actually as head of social, I had to beat uh, young Vaughan Wilkes who happened to be the, uh, 
the previous warden's son. Um, and again, uh, I think m m um, majorly for um, dirty shoes going into hall every time. But I was considerably embarrassed and uh, not quite sure whether I should go forward. Um, <clears throat> but um, anyway, I did, but I didn't hit him too hard. <laughs> Thank you for that. Mr. De Courcy Island, would you like to unmute yourself? Uh, well, perhaps this is a little naughty, but there were very few ladies around college in our day. But uh, three important ones, the housekeeper, Miss Legg, uh, the nurse in uh, the infirmary, and the sister in the infirmary, um, whose name was Sister Body and Nurse Balls. So they were known as the Leg, the Body and the Balls. <laughs> Very wicked. <laughs> Mr. Metcalf, over to you, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, I had uh, very bad experiences in Joneses. Um, the, beating, the, the beating had two halves. The first half is that when you had got a certain number of checks, you knew you, knew you were going to be beaten. But the awful thing is, rather like uh, Japanese uh, execution law, we didn't actually know when we were going to be beaten. So I think the longest I had to wait before I was beaten was something like 10 or 12 days. So you sat in social hall in mental agony, wondering when and how this is going to happen. And uh, uh, I, uh, I, I have observed that uh, in Joneses, there was a, a tradition of drawing blood when you beat, when somebody got beaten. And I think that was absolutely, totally brutal. And I'm glad, and I believe it was the, um, the senior, pre the, the, the pups who actually went to the warden sometime later than, than, than Milligan, um, who asked that they should stop stop doing it and, and I, I I think um, the, the cruelty of, of, of it and I was beaten quite a lot for very stupid things like running in the corridor or or imitating um, Mr. Lackland who was the Latin teacher who used to go yeah some of you will remember that um, and I was picked up and sent off once again to be beaten horrible I have never struck any of my children and uh, I think it's totally unnecessary. My father also beat my brother and me and uh, back in the 1940s I think and beating prep school was still absolutely awful and I can remember little little crowds of, of little boys standing waiting outside the headmaster's study at my prep school which was known as Amesbury um, and then when they came out trying not, not to cry to show that, that they had been beaten. So I think quite a lot of my career at Radley, much of which was actually quite amusing, um, was actually spent with a certain amount of fear. And uh, thank God we're not doing that anymore. Now that I know quite a lot of young, young Radleyans, because I see them as the current master of the old Radleyan Lodge, they are incredibly nice. And it's lovely to see today that uh, I think it's I think it's something like there are ten teachers for each boy at school, and it's such a civilized place. And if if um, if I could have afforded it, um, I sent my children elsewhere. Um, I, I I think Radley is a lovely, lovely school now. So well done, the, the way of those generations who've changed things from the the cruelty to, to what to, to what Radley is today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Metcalf. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yes, I can assure you that it is, it is not like that today. But thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Did anybody else want to say anything? Mr. Pierce Smith and then Mr. Roberts. Um, if you take yourself off mute, please. Mr. Pierce Smith, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Waving to George Metcalf. Attempting to, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. A lovely hour and a half.
Oh, lovely. Yes, I, no, thanks, oh, the all. time has flown. Mr. Roberts, did you want to say something before we wrap uh, up? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. A uh, couple of things I'd like to say. Firstly, about Pete and beating. I was beaten uh, on a number of occasions. It wasn't the actual beating which I found so awful. It was the fact that uh, when before you had a study, you were in a, in a common room, was somebody having to come in and pull you out to take you to be beaten. And then you had to walk back into that common room without showing any sign that you had beaten. I found that very difficult to deal with. That was one point about the beating, but the main point I really wanted to make was about a man called Goldsmith, who taught me mathematics, who I considered was the greatest teacher of mathematics that I certainly ever came across. And I can always remember with great amusement with his metre rule, where he used to scream at the top of his voice, which everybody heard in the science blocks, and crash the meter rule onto the desk if you had made a mistake. A ma fabulous man, and I wanted just to mention that to everybody, and I hope you all felt the same. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Oxton, you've got your, your hand up virtually. Yes. Yeah, OK, I'd just like and to Mr. echo... Mr. Evans, I see you. Sorry, Mr. Oxton. Yeah. Sorry, can you see me? Yes? yes. Can you hear me, more importantly? Absolutely, um, yes. OK. Uh, I just want to echo that last comment about Mr. Goldsmith. He was a truly splendid teacher and um, his uh, catchphrase when he was um, confronted by misbehaviour or stupidity was vile boy, yes. a vile boy, get out. And um, the other thing I actually raised my hand about the beatings business, which was all rather sad. I was the, whatever, um, school prefect in charge of my social G in 1959. And so it fell to me to beat a couple of boys during um, the whole of one term. And I tried not to beat them too hard. Um, what I appreciated was that the, the other, the next most senior prefect in, in the social, who then moved up to be school prefect after I'd left, uh, he was there to witness and to make sure that um, that I didn't indulge in excessive brutality, which I didn't. Um, but I do agree with with all the others who have said what a dreadful practice it was and what a good thing it is that that um, it no longer goes on. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. No, absolutely, completely agree, Mr. Evans. <coughs> Going back to uh, Mr. Goldsmith. The mental arithmetic uh, of us all was of a high order because at the beginning of every lesson you could hear him coming down the passage. Everybody would be present, nobody was late. You would hear him coming down the passage uh, two times four uh, divided by six times something, square root of something else, come in and then there would be a deathly silence as he picked on one of us to come up with the answer. And there was always two or three vile boys because nobody kept up with it. But mental arithmetic, I can still do it. Uh, wow, Mr. Um, wow, we've got three of you here. Mr. Dixon, Mr. Pierce Smith and Mr. Roberts. And then I think we'll probably wrap up. Oh, and Mr. Harlow in that order. And then we'll wrap up. So starting with you, Mr. Dixon, if you take yourself off mute. On mute. Thank you. I just wanted to add about Mr. Goldsmith. He taught me, obviously, when I was at Radley, and, and he was the only person who ever managed to persuade me to learn any mathematics, which in the end I found quite useful at Cambridge. Um, but he taught me because I was terrified of him. I hated being shouted at. Um, and the only way not to be shouted at was to actually get the answers right. He left Radley and became headmaster of a... a shouldn't call it a minor public school, but a lesser public school than Radley, which is Cokethorpe, which is what, neck just outside Oxford. Mm -hmm. One of my sons went, uh, as it happens. Um, so, and, and I know he died well, shortly after, at some point in the last few years, but I think he was quite a good headmaster. Thanks, that's all. 
uh, Mr. P. Smith. If you just take yourself off mute, sorry. And then it's Mr. Evans, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Harlow, but Mr. P. Smith, yes. David, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Da David, Go David Goldsmith was the Don in charge of the third 11, certainly in 1953 and 1954. Uh, when I played in the third 11, both those years. Uh, we won every match, I should say, um, both years. But uh, David Goldsmith was uh, basically fermented a, a wonderful um, sort of atmosphere among the team. Um, partly, I think, due to the fact that at the end of each game, we would always repair to the local pub and uh, we'd, uh, you know, have a couple of pints. Um, with David Goldsmith um, sort of uh, smiling and laughing in the, in the corner somewhere. And uh, so it was um, my memories of David Goldsmith and indeed of those two summer terms uh, were absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Evans, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Now, I just, uh, I already mentioned my story about the mental, mental arithmetic. That's all. Thank you. And Mr. Roberts, if you'd like to unmute yourself. PBO, hello. Hello, we can hear you. <laughs> hello. Hi, yes, we can hear you. Is that Sean? Yes. 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 Uh, coming back, back to Goldsmith, I can always remember just before uh, additional O level, I think it was in those days. Goldsmith was a great player of the horses. He used to bet on the horses on a regular basis, my understanding. And he came into the class a few days or the day before we were going to take the exam. And he said in his lo lovely lisping voice, which he used to have, if you may remember, I am going to tell you the answers to all the questions. So I expect everybody to pass. And he would then sit, and in those days, he used to have about four questions, which everybody knew were coming. And then another three or four, which you had to choose from. And he used to work out, because he used to back the horses, exactly what those questions would be. I think our class, the class I was in, averaged in the high 90% passes. He was brilliant in my opinion and I can't, I was very sad to hear that he died. That's all I wish to say and I've made my point. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. That's a lovely story. Mr. Harlow. I'd like to, we've paid tribute to quite a few of the very good people who taught us and I would like to add the name of Paul Croson, who was my social tutor and um, I remained a friend of his till he died, and I, I think he was a very good bloke indeed. Thank you. I had a lot to thank him for. Mr. Harlow. Well, I think um, we will wrap up there unless anybody has anything final burning that they want to say or sing, um, then uh, we will wrap up. Well, thank you so much, everybody. It's been lovely to see you all and hear your story. So thank you. We'll end it there. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you all. Thank you very much. Excellent. Can we do it more often? Yep. Thank you. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, certainly. We will definitely try and do it more often. And more your reminiscences. The joy of technology enables it. So we should we should definitely do this.